Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is George Carey. I work here at FIA. And uh, welcome this morning, Tuesday morning, uh, Tuesday after Memorial Day, Memorial Day weekend. <clears throat> uh, this morning, we thought we'd uh, talk about the subject of outdoor reset. Uh, what it is, um, why on the screen, like it says, why every hydronic system really could benefit from having uh, an outdoor reset control uh, uh, installed on this system or you know, applied to their hydronic system. <clears throat> Uh, it's not really about uh, controls and getting specifically into controls. We are the TECMA representative in New England and have been for the last 30 years. <clears throat> and TECMA is, some, is, is known quite well with the, with the concept of outdoor reset. Um, <clears throat> but instead of spending this morning talking specifically about controls, we really just want to talk about the concept and, and why and, and how. And whether it be a single boiler, multiple boilers, radiant heat, mix and controls, et cetera, just the concept of it. So that's what we want to spend a little bit of time this morning uh, uh, talking about with you guys this morning. So without any further ado, I'm just going to kind of jump into it and uh, let's, let's, let's get this thing going. I uh, had written, I, I write for a couple different trade magazines uh, you know, throughout the industry. Um, and uh, so one of the articles I had written was this thing. It's actually posted on our website. But uh, why weather responsive controls are a no brainer, which is why it makes sense. And, and there's a lot of different reasons. And we're going to kind of expound on that this morning. <laughs> to begin with, um, you kind of look at this kind of a basic picture, if you will, a drawing of a home. And it's the question is asked, you know, what is the goal of the ideal heating system? And the goal would be to maintain the building at a constant comfortable temperature. And the way to do that ideally is you would try to input the heat as the heat was lost from the structure, whether it's a 50 degree day or a zero degree day or anywhere in between as the building is losing its BTUs to the outside, because why? Heat goes to cold, so there's always going to be that movement of heat to cold. Obviously, through you know very well insulated homes and, and uh, windows, et cetera, uh, you're trying to minimize that, but it's always going to happen. Heat is always going to go to cold. And so the ideal heating system would be try to just replace that heat as it's being lost and try to do it in an unnoticeable fashion to try to maintain that constant comfortable space temperature of whatever the number is 68 69 70 degrees this drawing here happens to just show uh, radiant tubing in the floor but it could be baseboard it could be cast iron radiators it could be a lot of different things but the ideal system would be just replace it as you lose it and it's constantly losing it it, it will vary at the rate of losing based on insulating factors, et cetera, and construction, what have you. But it's always going to happen. The challenge is this. What makes achieving this ideal system difficult? <clears throat> this is a chart out of an old B&G design manual. Nothing too fancy, but the point of this, this whole slide right here is, here's my total heating season, the top dash lines. Here is the percentage of time that I spend at design conditions, which is very little. It's three, four, five percent maybe at the most. And here is the rest of the heating season. Uh, design operational time at less than design conditions. So how do I do that when I have very, very varying loads and usually light loads relative to my design conditions? And that's a challenge. <laughs> So then another question comes up, what has the greatest impact on a building's heat load? And the answer is outdoor temperature. And when we say that, it's not just a subjective thought, it's just data. Right here, I'm just showing a quick snapshot of bin data for the city of Chicago from an ASHRAE publication. And the Weather Bureau keeps track of this. And what they're saying here, here's the number of days at various outdoor temperatures. And so, you know, as the outdoor temperature gets below, in this case here, they're making, this, they're making the um, assumption that we're trying to maintain maybe a space at 69, 70 degrees. So anytime it's below 
that number, heat is going to go to cold. I got to replenish that heat. And so they're listing out here the number of days at these various outdoor temperatures. And as you can see, as you get to your really cold temperatures, it's very, very little number of days, relatively speaking, to the rest of the heating season that we're sitting at that design condition. Of course, when it happens, we got to have that boiler, that radiation, that horsepower to replenish the heat loss to keep the space at the design temperature. But the number of times that it's there is very, very few. <clears throat> in fact, you can actually do some calculations, but around here in New England, 80% of the heating season requires less than 50% of the total BTU load. So it's, it's, it's kind of challenging because then you say, okay, well, what size boiler do you need to install? You know, when, you, when you're doing a heat loss, right? And it's under design conditions, you gotta make sure you have that boiler or boilers there to supply the BTUs during that design condition, that design heat loss. Uh, but for the rest of the year, which is, you know, like they're saying, 80% of the season, you need 50% of the heat of the capacity. How, how do you wrestle with that and go back to that original first picture of just trying to input the heat as the space is losing it, as the building structure is losing that BTUs? And the same holds true, you know, for radiation. How do you, you know, how do you size the, the baseboard or the cast iron radiator or the radiant tubing or what have you, whatever your terminal unit is, an air handler? Well, it's got to be for design conditions. And then how does it operate comfortably or, um, uh, you know, making the space comfortable during the rest of the heating season when you have really technically too much radiation in the space for the majority of the heating season? Again, just another bin data. This one happens to show hours instead of days. <clears throat> but it's, it's all driving to the same point that when you get to these design conditions out here, there's very few hours relative to the total heating season uh, of design conditions. So you know, when you step back and say, okay, well, basically there's two ways of controlling heat delivered to the space. And the first one is water flow control. And what they're trying to show here in this, in this uh, graph, if you will, is that the water flow control has a very non-linear relationship between what they're showing on the bottom here is percentage of design flow rate and then percentage of design heat transfer. So if you start over here on the far right, if I provide the design flow rate, the GPM, I will get 100% of the heat transfer of that terminal unit. <clears throat> but what they're showing also here is if I was to mess up and only provide, say, 50% or half of the design flow rate through that radiation, I can still achieve almost 90% of the design heat transfer. So hence this curve, this, this, bow, this bow, if you will, is very nonlinear. So when you're using flow control as a means of controlling heat output, it's not very accurate. You really got to get that flow rate reduced quite a bit to really impact the heat transfer of the terminal unit. And we probably don't pay, in, you know, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about this or talking about it, but you'd actually, you already know this. Because if you look at anybody's baseboard manufacturer's literature, they'll show uh, the heat transfer and output based on water temperature. In this case here, say we designed around 180 degrees they'll show one gallon a minute and four gallons a minute. And at one gallon a minute, they're saying per linear foot, you're gonna get around 580 BTUs. And the point of it all is if you quadruple it to four gallons a minute, you're picking up only 30 BTUs per linear foot. Or conversely, think you're designing around this four GPM and you're getting 610 and you mess up and you only provide one GPM, you're only losing 30 BTUs per foot. You're not losing that much. Flow has a very, uh, has the least impact in heat transfer. When you get into this slide and you start talking about it, you have three elements. I mean, there's other elements as well, but to keep it simple, you have the uh, surface area of the heat exchanger. So in our example, maybe that's baseboard in the room. Well, that, that baseboard isn't going away. So that's a given. And then you're going to have a temperature difference. 
and the temperature between the heating medium, which is the water, and the air that's flowing around the base boat on the outside, there's a temperature difference. And the third factor is the flow rate. And the flow of those three has the least impact in terms of heat transfer. That's why hydronics is so forgiving. <clears throat> you really, really have to mess up quite a bit to actually have an impact on the heat transfer of that terminal unit. So the Hydronics Institute actually developed this formula for estimating the increased output for baseboard for flow rates greater than one gallon a minute. I mean, it's not that I'm gonna spend a lot of time, but <clears throat> this is where they're coming up. So if I have one gallon a minute, I'm getting 550 BTUs per linear foot, and I move the flow rate, I increase the flow rate to um, five gallons a minute. You'll see, it's not a lot, but I will, every time I increase the flow rate, um, and, and some people in the industry sometimes will say, you know, well, water's moving too fast. I can't get the BTUs off. That's not true. Um, anytime you increase the flow rate, you're reducing the boundary, uh, the insulating boundaries around the, the, the inside walls of that tubing, and you're actually increasing the heat transfer. Of course, you're not increasing it by a lot, and the added expense of a higher head loss because you're increasing the flow rate, which increases the head loss, which increases the size of the circulator. You know, there's, there's not a lot of benefit, but just know that as you increase flow rate, you will increase B2 output. So here's just a quick example, again, out of one of those older BNG design manuals where they're showing water flow control. And the thing that I just want to point out, which has really nothing to do with outdoor reset, so to speak, but look at, I got a three-way valve and I got a three-way valve and they're located in different connection points. So this three-way valve would, would be referred to as a diverting valve. And, a, and an easy way to remember a diverting valve is that diverting valve has um, one inlet and two outlets. I can either divert, bypass the coil, or I can go through the coil. And I'm controlling the flow to, to, to control the heat transfer of that coil. I'm gonna to have to be pretty aggressive on my actuator's movement to reduce the output of that coil. So the path of the water is either in here and out this port, out that port, or some mixture thereof. Over here, I just have a regular T on the supply, but I have a mixing valve on the outlet. And the mixing valve, the difference between the diverting and the mixing is the mixing has actually two inputs and one out. So I can enter into the bypass here, or I can enter in through the coil, and I'll mix to get a, an outlet uh, flow rate in this case here on the return. But both of them are trying to control the output of the coil by controlling the flow rate of the coil. Very inaccurate. This is just kind of showing it's, a, it's saying, look at when it's really cold out, so you're in that zero, five, 10, 15 degree temperature range and you're using flow control, it's okay. It's, it's not that inaccurate. It's okay because you have the load. You're looking for BTUs and you're providing it. What happens though is as the outdoor temperature starts to warm, and so now you're cycling on and off, <clears throat> air temperature swings occur, efficiency drops. It's not very accurate to use flow control valve, excuse me, use flow control. The other negative is intermittent zone operation just causes boilers to short cycle. And the boiler can't get to that steady state efficiency. It's an older chart here, but the same look at. As you can increase the on time, you increase the efficiency of the boiler. This is obviously a, uh, a mid-efficiency um, appliance that they're looking at, uh, as opposed to, to nowadays today, we're probably looking at closer to 90, 92, 95%. But the point of it all is, the longer you can get that boiler to run, and when you have light loads like this, <clears throat> you're gonna have a lot of short cycling, so you're never gonna get to that efficiency. So what's the other option? We just talked about water flow control valve, excuse me, water flow. The other option is water temperature. And as you can see on this graph here, the relationship of water temperature and heat transfer is almost linear. I mean, they're showing it as linear. It might be subtly different depending upon the terminal unit. But the point being, when you change the water temperature, you really impact the output of that heat transfer, percentage of design heat transfer. So instead of having this graph on the bottom here talk about flow rate, percentage of design flow rate, what it's talking about 
is percentage of the delta T between the air and the water. So those three factors we talked about, the heat transfer, surface area, now we're talking about the temperature difference between the air and the water. And then the third factor was that flow rate. Well, let's take the flow rate factor right out and let's address this. Percentage of delta T between air and water. If I have my design delta T, I'm going to get my design heat transfer out of this terminal unit. As I start to reduce that delta T, the relationship between air and water, I immediately impact my heat transfer. It's a very, it's a much more effective way of reducing the output. And you say, well, why would you want to reduce the output? Well, if you remember some of the other earlier graphs, 80% um, of the heating season, you need 50% or more or less of your design heat loss, you know, that you need the boiler, the radiation on the, that really cold day. So I can play with the water temperature. I can really significantly reduce the output. So then you go back to that very first picture, which talked about if I could just replace the heat as I'm losing it, this could be a very effective way of doing that with water temperature control. So just a quick example, say we're talking design water temperatures of 180 degrees with a design indoor of 70. So the delta T, the design delta T would be 110. So this example just kind of falls through and say, look at 50% of 110 is 55 degrees. <clears throat> if you were to take the water temperature and lower 180 by 55 and circulate 125 through that radiation, you'd have about 50% of the heat transfer, the B2 output of that radiation, which might be very appropriate, you know, under those design conditions, or those, that set of conditions, because I don't have that design heat loss. I have something less than that. So why not just lower the water temperature, which reduces the BTU output of your baseboard, your radiant heat, your cast iron radiator, whatever it is. So it's a very effective way of controlling heat output, which, which more mirrors what are, what are the conditions, the current conditions that the heating system is experiencing. So here's another example, but instead of doing water flow, we're using three-way valves to control water temperature. And again, a three-way valve acting as a diverting and a three-way valve over here acting as a mixing. So in this case here, diverting, we said a diverting valve has one input and two outputs. So I'm going to either go through the boiler and pick up some heat, or I'm going to divert and then I'm gonna mix at that T. Whatever went through the boiler of temperature, whatever the return temperature is, they, these two mix right here, goes out to the system. Over here, which is probably a little more common in, in, in its orientation would be a mixing valve. So now I'm taking return water and I'm either going up the bypass or I'm going through the boiler, picking up some BTUs, and those two will mix right here at that, that point. And that's why we refer to it as a mixing valve. But a mixing valve, different from a diverting valve, has two inputs and then one output. But both accomplish the same thing of changing the water temperature to kind of you know, uh, recognize what is the current set of conditions. I'm going to change my water temperature to lower or increase my heat output of my radiation. So when you start looking at a traditional boiler, a traditional boiler operation, the boiler always operates at a temperature calculated to make up for the heat loss on the coldest day of the year. So, you know, you have your high limit, you set it at 180, 190, 175, whatever the number needs to be. It's kind of an inefficient use of energy. There's a lot of on off cycling. Every time the thermostat calls, you're displacing the ambient temperature, you're gonna get expansion noises, you're gonna get temperature swings. You're gonna undershoot, you're gonna overshoot. And for years, most homes operated this way and it was okay. But as energy costs started to uh, become more of a focus or a factor, uh, people started looking for different ways or other better ways of controlling my heating. Is there more efficient, is there less costly uh, methods of, of controlling heat? And yes, there is. So what is it? What is reset? When the thermostat calls for heat, you're going to introduce some type of reset control, and that control is going to operate, in this case here, a single boiler to supply an outdoor reset temperature. You're going to change the water temperature based on the outdoor temperature. Remember at the beginning, one of the things we said, what has the greatest impact on the load of a structure 
it's going to be the outdoor temperature. So I'm going to have some type of control that might have some kind of either indoor feedback or just a thermostat call. I'm going to have an outdoor sensor. I'm going to look at the outdoor temperature. And based on that, I'm going to make let, allow this control to make a decision on what this boiler should be providing. So what is a reset curve? Basically, what you're doing is you're taking your design water temperature minus your design indoor temperature. And that number is divided by your design indoor temp minus your design outdoor temp. So if I was to apply some numbers, and I'd say, okay, 180 design water minus my indoor, 70, divided by my indoor, 70, minus my design outdoor. So in this case, in the Boston area, typically it's like 9 or 10 degrees uh, the ASHRAE states. So when you do the math formula, 110 divided by 60 comes out to 1.83. That would be the reset curve, uh, reset ratio of 1.83. What? How does that apply? For every one degree drop in temperature outdoors, the supply water needs to increase by 1.83 degrees. So when you get to that design set of conditions of 10 degrees outside, the supply water temperature is 180. And then anytime it's not 10, I don't need to provide 180. I can provide something lower than that. <clears throat> and, and that's what this reset curve and reset ratio is all about. So then it, within the industry, sometimes questions will come up. Well, if you have copper baseboard, um, it won't work unless you provide 180 degrees to it. And that's not necessarily true depending upon the set of conditions that you're under. So the question is, what happens to baseboard when lower water temperature is supplied? Well, right in their own charts, they, all the baseboard manufacturers will list. Now, typically, they're talking even higher temperatures over here. And they usually won't go down below 140. They won't publish it. But, and as you can see, obviously, as you lower the water temperature, you lower the BTU per, out, per, per linear foot. <clears throat> this was out of one of the engineering catalogs of one of the baseboard manufacturers. And, and, I, and I appreciate it, I grabbed it. And right here, average water temperature. And here's like th standard three quarters copper baseboard. And they're actually showing low temperatures down to as low as 190 degrees. Now the BTU output, it's substantially lower than what it was over here, that 170, 180, 190. <clears throat> but that's okay because in a fall or a spring day when the load is there, so you're still trying to re replenish the BTUs, but not nearly as much as design day, you just lower the BTU output of the radiation. You start thinking back to that original picture of just trying to replace the heat as you're losing it. Water temperature control is pretty effective. I actually had this in my home, my earlier home that I had, we just sold um, a few months ago. But I had an oil-fired boiler and a copper baseboard on and designed the monoflow system. And we kind of did a constant circulation based on outdoor air. And with the oil um, being a non-condensing boiler, uh, I could only go so low without getting into flue gas issues. So we introduced a four-way mixing valve. We'll talk a little bit about that at, near the end of the presentation. But <clears throat> so I would send out, you know, on a mild day, I'd be sending out 100 degree water. And I'd be talking to people and say, well, you can't heat a house with 100 degree water to a copper baseboard. And actually you can, as long as it's not 10 degrees out. <laughs> you know, it, it, on milder conditions, I don't need as many BTUs. Lower the water temperature kind of makes the house more comfortable and a little less noticeable, the heating system. Same thing applies to radiators. What happens when you lower the water temperature to them? Well, here's just a graph showing, you know, um, what's the water temperature and then what is the BTU output or BTUs per square foot rating. We've talked about square foot in some of our other classes. It was a term, an expression describing the capacity of a radiator. But as you lower that water temperature, you're just lowering the BTU output of the radiators. Perfect. On a mild day, I don't need that much. Again, chasing after this goal, trying to maintain the building at a constant comfortable temperature by just replenishing the heat as we lose it. So then sometimes the guys will say, well, is this like a new concept that Techmark came up with? Uh, no, not at all. B&G actually provided what they refer to as a comfort control system back in the uh, 50s, 50s and 60s. 
And this right here was actually the outdoor sensor. And you'd actually kind of poke a hole through the wall in the basement and you'd push this thing through. So this outdoor sensor here was measuring the outdoor temperature. And then they had this comfort control valve that they referred to. And basically all they did was they changed the water temperature based on the outdoor air in some settings. And so the pumps, booster pumps, here it is on the return. And depending upon the positioning of this valve right here, this comfort control valve, the return water would either go through the boiler, pick up some BTUs and go out to the system, or it would go up the bypass here, bypass the boiler and go out to the system, or depending upon the position of this valve, some mixture of both. Some of the path might be easier to go this way. Some of the path might say, hey, go through the boiler, pick up some energy. The two of them would mix right here at that T, and then a blended water temperature would go out to the system. So it's nothing new. They've known about this technology. They've known about this phenomenon of uh, heat transfer and changing the water temperature to increase or decrease the BTU, uh, uh, BTUs available from the radiation. Thrush, another big player back in the 50s, they had uh, a mixing valve, a three-way mixing valve. And again, circulate on the return, go through the boiler to pick up energy, or go up the bypass. <clears throat> mix and go out to the system. Nothing new. Taking a snapshot of a, a page out of uh, B&G's 1960s training manual. And they're showing a three-way valve on the boiler to provide reset. That's what they're talking about. They got this reset controller that's looking at the outdoor temperature, looking at the supply water, and then controlling the actuator to send hot boiler water either up to the system or into the return uh, to bypass, if you will. So nothing new. Even Taco back in the early 70s when the uh, oil embargo took place in 1973, they come up with a control called the Mastermind. And the same thing, it was designed to change the water temperature uh, based on you know, outdoor conditions. So what are the benefits of using outdoor temperature, outdoor reset? Well, one of the things can be uh, less fluctuation of indoor temperature. When the water temperature matches the load conditions, excess heat is not forced into the thermal mass of the heating system or the building with overheated water. Rooms don't typically undergo noticeable temperature changes that would normally occur with simple on-off cycles. Um, you're getting into some comfort uh, um, benefits, but that pinging noise that you hear with copper pipe when it expands. So reduced expansion noises. When using the reset control, the water temperature changes occur over hours or even days rather than in seconds, as it does with an on-off flow control. So that piping expansion noises are far less likely to be noticed. Nearly constant circulation. Because the water temperature is just right for the current conditions, flow through the radiation isn't, is seldom interrupted. You know, constant circulation, circulation evens out the heating system, making it less noticeable. Now, if you're dealing with a non-condensing boiler and you don't introduce any kind of mixing, you're still going to have some cycling on and off, but at least you'll be down to like 140 degrees or something to that effect, not constantly providing that higher 180, 185 temperature. <clears throat> and one of the other benefits, and it's, it's not, you know, you don't sell an outdoor reset to say this, but this is what happens. It's, it's kind of a, a, a benefit. By lowering the water temperature to match the load, the zoning thermostats, circulators, and zone valves, you know, they stay on longer. There's less cycling, which kind of extends their life expectancy. And then what really, uh, years back when, when um, energy costs really skyrocketed, you know, uh, there for a while, uh, the consumers are very interested in this. Reduce fuel use. Outdoor reset control has established its ability to reduce fuel consumptions, both residentially and commercially. <clears throat> and obviously, what they're saying here is the savings will vary from project to project. But typically, what we've been asked over the years, we say, hey, if you're going to buy a single stage boiler reset control from Technon, you know, what can you expect? Typically, it was 12 to 15 percent was a pretty comfortable number. The other thing, improving boiler efficiency. <clears throat> um, 
when you introduce a boiler reset, in this case here, a single stage boiler reset control, run the boiler at the lowest possible temperature. <clears throat> You're gonna purge the boiler after the burner shuts off. So you know, any residual heat, get it up out of the boiler and up into the space. When the boiler's not needed, turn it off. And probably the most important feature, if you will, is try to reduce uh, boiler short cycling. And that goes a long way to improving the efficiency of that boiler or boiler plant. But by lowering the water temperature, the system, you know, here we're showing a non-condensing. So you have to honor the boiler minimums so that we don't reduce the flue gases to the point where they start condensing and start damaging the, the flue pipe, the breaching and then the acidic condensate gets into the cast iron boilers and creates all kinds of problems. But simply lowering the water temperature, um, we're just reducing some losses. You've got uh, distribution losses are uh, lessened and jacket losses are lessened. So uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a, a, a study done and it was compiled by the Energy Resource Center located in St. Paul, Minnesota. And basically, they, they asked Tecma for 23 single stage boiler reset controls, and they applied them to 23 boiler rooms throughout St. Paul, Minnesota. And they basically just compiled, you know, they, they, they analyzed, you know, what was the results. And on average, between the buildings, it was about 12 and a half percent. Some buildings have experienced very little savings. Some of them were actually quite extreme, but on the average, it was around 12, 12 and a half percent. Uh, that study is actually available on Tecmon's website if, if someone was interested in, in reading about that, uh, how they conducted it, and, and the final results. But basically, um, outdoor reset as a general statement is two things. Save some money and make the system more comfortable, better comfort control. And that's a very you know, basic picture of what's going on when you introduce an outdoor reset control. In this case here, I have a single boiler. I'm gonna control the firing of this boiler. I'm gonna look at the outdoor temperature with an outdoor sensor. I have to measure the supply water temperature. So I gotta have a sensor to measure it. In this case here, maybe I'm controlling a, a zone pump, but if I had two, three, four, five zones, I'm probably gonna have like a relay box over here and that control the zoning, but that relay box will then give it demand. So instead of going directly to the boiler and let it run on its limit, I'm going to put that call through this device here. This it's basically software. You're buying, you know, computer software that's going to make decisions on what temperature it needs to run, how to run that boiler, etc. That, but that's what a reset control is all about. So some of the limitations. Well, it depends on the boiler, but if you're dealing with non-condensing, then you might have to honor this boiler minimum to keep that flue gases and the and the uh, and the venting and the and the the vent and the chimney from um, from condensing back into condensate because you know, that's that's good. Now, if you're dealing with a non, I mean, with a modcon boiler, modulating condensing, then this boiler minimum, you know, is, is taken right out of the equation, and you can truly just operate all the way down along that reset curve with no fear of damaging your boiler plant and getting getting the benefits of uh, additional savings. So sometimes a question will come in, well, you know, I got this indirect water heater. How do I recover the indirect if I'm doing an outdoor reset? <clears throat> and basically all of the controls that are out there, whether they're on the boiler or separate tech mark control, they acknowledge that when you have a different call, when you have a domestic call, either through a sensor or an acrostat, you're gonna say, hey, forget outdoor reset for a second and drive that boiler to a you know predetermined number, typically 170, 180 degrees to recover the tank by putting that hot boiler water through the coil. And all they're showing here is are you doing it with an individual pump, which is 90, 95% of the applications, or are you using a zone valve? And then you need to know whether you run your boiler pump, or system pump, I should say, um, or shut the system pump off if you're on priority and just dedicate your BTUs to your indirect. But there are ways of handling it. So then you get into what about sensor locations? Because they're kind of important. If we're saying, hey, the biggest impact is outdoor air, so I need an outdoor sensor. And then I want to change the water temperature, so I need to measure the water temperature. So it's just important where they're located. So outdoor sensors, north side ideally. Um, I would not, you know, don't expose them to the south side if you can avoid that, because the sun's going to just bake the sensor and kind of give it a, a, 
an improper reading. And then you don't want to put that outdoor sensor anywhere near some type of heat source, whether it be a dry event, or in this case here, they're showing a fireplace, a chippy from the fireplace. You just don't want it to be influenced other than truly what is going on outside. In terms of the flow on the water sensor, the supply sensor, you want to make sure when it's reading that there's good flow going across that sensor so it's accurate. Here's just a snapshot Tecmar had to provide in one of their training uh, manuals or um, uh, PowerPoints, I should say. So they're showing it, you know, located underneath an overhang here on the north side of the house, not being influenced at all by the sun. Um, when you get into uh, the, the supply sensor on copper pipe, regardless of the pipe size, you can strap it on with this tie wrap. It's a kind of a heat sensitive <clears throat> um, tie wrap that, and, and the sensor itself almost has like a flat spot that would then mount on the pipe. When you get into steel pipe, black iron pipe, uh, anything up to inch and a quarter, you can still mount it on the outside and you know with the tie wrap and then obviously just insulate it so it's not affected by any room temperature influence. When you get into inch and a half and larger on the black eye and they uh, uh, Tecmar strongly suggests using a, a temperature well just because the wall thickness starts to get too thick and it starts to influence the reaction time of, um, of what the water temperature is inside that pipe relative to the sensor. But on copper pipe Regardless, you can either do a well, but you don't have to because the wall thickness uh, and the heat transfer of the, of the copper pipe uh, does not affect negatively the sensors reading. And here they're just showing a, a snapshot of it. So you get this flat spot right here and that's gonna be mounted to the pipe and then you have this heat sensitive um, tie wrap, if you will. So then another question, a kind of common application is, can I apply outdoor reset with multiple boilers? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, there are benefits to, to, to taking one big boiler and cutting it in half, or taking that one big boiler and cutting it into thirds or quarters. Um, you, you pick up uh, quite a bit of efficiency. And again, remember, like we talked about earlier, 80% of the heating season requires less than 50%. So if I can take that big boiler and cut them down into two or three or four small boilers, then I run that one boiler very efficiently and I keep the other three off, which the building owner views as very efficient. So there's a lot of benefits to multiple boilers and applying them to outdoor reset. And again, that whole thing about trying to reduce or minimize boiler short cycling. The longer I can get that boiler to run, the more efficient it's gonna run. So if I have a boiler that's technically you know, too small, if you will, he's working very hard, but the load on the building isn't that great compared to design conditions. So he's running very efficiently and the other one, two or three boilers are off, um, not wasting any energy. One of the things that pops up though in the industry over the years is when I get into multiple boilers, you can actually start to encounter multiple piping um, possibilities. And, you know, there are some applications that really aren't that good, although they've been done over the years, and then you kind of move to uh, isolating um, boilers, because the, the idea is when the boiler's not running, we really don't want to have any heat, hot water flowing through the off boilers. And you kind of accomplish that over here with these examples. Over here, there's constantly flow system flow going through all three boilers in this example. And... So one of the things in the industry, uh, there's a gentleman named John Ziegenthaler, and he's written, writes every month for one of the trade magazines. He's written a few books. But I grabbed this quote that he had, and he said, another critical requirement of maintaining high efficiency in a multiple boiler system is preventing heated system water from flowing through non-operational boilers. Otherwise, these off-boilers become radiators, they become heat emitters. So what you're chasing after, you're kind of defeated by putting that hot water through that off boiler. And that's what these two drawings over here, these two piping examples show, is whether it's a direct return, which creates imbalance, so I have imbalanced flow through the three boilers, which leads to another whole set of issues. They address it over here by showing a reverse return so that the first guy on the return is the last guy on the supply, and the last guy on the return is the first on the supply. So I have a balance in terms of equal flow, but I still have flow through off boilers. 
And actually, here's an example of a manufacturer that you know promoted that concept with these multiple boilers here that actually provide this manifold. And this manifold was designed to provide this reverse return. And here's a quick, this is what we mean by that. So here's my return coming back from the system. And my first return boiler is also going to be my last boiler on the supply out to the building. And then my last boiler on the return is going to be my first boiler out. So I have even flow through all three. But the problem is I have flow through all three. So if only one boiler is running, the other two are acting like radiators, waste of energy. So then you can get into, you say, okay, I'll do a primary, secondary. Then at least I can isolate and I have no flow through the boilers when they're off unless the particular pump comes on and the boiler's firing. But there's a limitation or a kind of a problem with this one pipe primary secondary. And I just want to share with you, share it with you very quickly. And what we're saying here is I have a 300,000 BTU boiler that fails and the contractor decides to come in and replace it with three 100,000 BTU boilers. And he's going to have a boiler pump on each boiler. and He's going to pipe it primary secondary. And he's going to do it like this, one pipe. So one main going out to the building and consecutively closely spaced teased for the three boilers. And so under, under design conditions, 300,000 BTUs would represent on a 20 degree delta T, uh, typically um, 30 gallons a minute. So I'm pumping 30 GPM through the building on a design day, 190 degrees, taking a 20 degree drop, coming back at 170. So if I had a multiple boiler stage of control and a supply sensor sitting over here, I'd be looking at chasing after that 190. So under design conditions, I got to replenish that. Water's coming back 20 degrees cooler. I got to heat it back up. So boiler one comes on. And getting into primary secondary uh, and, and the common pipe, which is another subject we talked about in our primary secondary seminar, <clears throat> if each boiler is designed at 100,000 BTUs at a 20 degree temperature difference, I'm going to have a flow rate of 10 gallons a minute on each pump. So the first pump comes on and he's going to introduce 170 degree water because that's the return temperature coming back from the building. And I'm going to take it at a flow rate of about 10 GPM. I'm going to pump 10 GPM through 100,000 BTU boiler who's going to provide a 20 degree temperature rise in this case. So I'm coming out of the boiler at 190. And you say, oh, great. That's exactly what I'm looking for over here. I want 190 degrees. The problem is I'm only pumping 10 GPM. So when that 30 gallons a minute of 170 hits this T, 10 goes this way because the pump turned on. 20 goes across the common of 170, and he's going to mix with the 10 at 190, and I'm going to have a blended temperature of 177 at a flow rate of 30 gallons a minute. So then the stage of control says, hey, I need 190. 177 is not cutting it. So the second boiler comes on. So now I have an inlet temperature of 177 at a flow rate of 10. I, I transfer my 100,000 BTUs. I bump up the temperature by 20 degrees. Now I'm coming out of that boiler at 197. So first of all, hopefully that high limit isn't set below that, which it probably isn't. <clears throat> but I have a different temperature. I have 170 on the first boiler, 177 on the second. I still have that 20 gallons a minute of 177 that moves across the common that's going to meet this 10 at 197 and it's going to provide a blended 30 gallons a minute of 184. So now I need to bring on that third boiler. And in doing so, I have an inlet temperature of 184, 10 GPM, provide the 100,000 BTUs. I'm going to bump it up 20 degrees. I got to make sure my high limit, you know, doesn't shut this thing off at 200 degrees. I got to bump up the temperature. And in doing so, I will get a blended flow rate of 30 gallons a minute at 190, which is what I'm chasing after. So the, the benefit of primary secondary is when the boilers are off, no flow through the off boiler, that's a positive. The downside of this consecutive one pipe, one behind the other, is each boiler is heating the next boiler. And you can really get to some high internal temperatures to get your blended mixed temperature. The best way on a multiple boiler system is to have a manifold, have one set of closely spaced T's and then just have this manifold and feed each individual boiler off of this. The benefit being it's, it's the same return temperature 
for all three boilers. I'm not doing that blended like I did in the one pipe primary secondary. <clears throat> Here's just a quick example of a guy who took a picture of a job out in the field where he, he made his own manifold, but he had two boilers, two big oil fired boilers. And here's this closely spaced T's right here. And uh, the return coming back, whatever that return temperature is, is the same for this boiler as it is for this. Whatever the temperature rise across the boilers, injected into that into the supply pipe and out to the system. So that, that, that is kind of your best way, if you will, of introducing multiple boilers, whether they be modulating, condensing, whether they be oil fired, whether they be atmospheric, is kind of create that one manifold right here and then individual takeoffs to the number of boilers that you have so at least they're rece receiving or seeing the same return temperature one other thing to talk to you about with outdoor reset is mixing i can do mixing uh and why would i there's a bunch of different reasons um design temperatures could be lower than what the boiler can support if you're getting into atmospheric or non-condensing boilers and you have say a radiantly heated system i'm going to probably introduce some type of mixing a three-way valve a four-way valve whatever the case may be <clears throat> um, uh, another reason would be um, this down here i want to provide full system re system reset which i did at my home for, for 20 plus years 25 years i had an, had an oil fired boiler i had to honor the flue gas issues so i didn't want to go below the dew point so I would typically keep the boiler at 140, 145, introducing that uh, four-way valve. I could then provide full reset out to the building, um, regardless of the boiler's limitations by mixing down. Another thing which maybe not as common anymore because we're, we're providing so many modulated condensing boilers that are designed to see low temp, but in years past when you had a sectional cast iron boiler, and even today, I guess if you had an oil fired, commercial boiler you didn't want to you didn't want to uh, you didn't want to have the boiler experience uh, thermal stress or thermal shock so you can introduce a mixing valve to provide boiler return protection but when you're mixing um, there's a couple things just to point out real quickly one if you only have one mixing point meaning one pump this is my distribution pump and he's going and he's either going up the bypass or he's going through the heat source to mix but if i only have that one pump i only have one mixing point the point of this drawing is whatever the return temperature is that's what's going back to your heat source if you wanted to provide you know protection on the heat source as well as mixing out to the building then you needed two pumps one pump here again out to the building i'm going to go up the bypass i'm going to go through my heat source pickup temperature and then go out as a mixed temperature. But also whatever's coming back, if that's too cool for the boiler plant, by adding this second pump, I can take some of that hot boiler water down the bypass, elevate that return temperature, so I, I raise it up and I protect the heat source. So if I need two mixing points, one and two, I need two pumps. You can't get two mixing points with just one pump. What are the devices? You know, they're showing a two-way valve, very, very rare, but three ways and four ways, very common. And then obviously you can use an injection pump as another option. So when you're mixing using mixing valves, here's just a couple of mechanical layouts, piping diagrams. This one here, again, back to that one pump. So whatever's going out to the system, whatever that delta T is, that return temperature, if it's not going up the bypass, that is what's going back to the boiler. So I do not offer any boiler return protection here. Then if I'm a non-condensing boiler, that boiler is in trouble. A way to correct it is to add that second pump. And then the way to add a second pump with a mixing device is use primary secondary pumping. Closely spaced T's, I have a boiler pump, pump in the boiler plant, and I have a system pump going out to, in this case here, maybe radiant heat. And then whatever that return cold water temperature is, it's going to be blended with whatever my boiler plant temperature is. And then my boiler temperature is obviously too hot for the radiant. So I take a little bit of that 180 and I mix it down with the bypass to get to my design temperature of 120. Down at the bottom here, I'm showing a four way valve. But again, a four way valve with two pumps so that I have two mixing points 
one for the system, what the desired temperature is for the system, and one perhaps to protect, in this case here, a, a non-condensing boiler. And I'm showing I can put that primary secondary connection on the boiler plant, or I can put it on the system side. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> but the point of, of all of this is if I want two mixing points, I need two pumps to achieve it. And that's just kind of kind of a cutaway of what the inside of a four-way valve looks like. And they have this um, flap, if you will, this flapper that kind of just the actuator repositions it and it closes off or it opens up the different ports so that I can achieve the desired water temperatures. And anytime you're dealing with a mixing device and you're dealing with a non-condensing boiler, so you're looking for return protection, when you deal with a Tecmar mixing control, it kind of has two bosses. One boss is, okay, what's my water temperature going out to the building? And then the other boss is, what's going back to the boiler plant? And if there's a conflict, the boiler plant return temperature always wins because we want to protect this investment. Once this is up to temperature, then we'll start looking at the supply temperature and, and adjust accordingly to satisfy the supply. <clears throat> Another way of mixing instead of a mixing device like a mixing valve is to do injection mixing. And again, they're shown a two-way valve, very, very rare, not that common, but a, a variable speed injection pump had over the last 10, 12, 15 years has become very popular as another means. And sometimes one of the angles that some of the contractors will view is I don't typically carry an extra actuator and mixing valve on my truck, but I typically have a water lubricated pump on my truck at all times. And that's what this injection pump, this variable speed injection pump is just a standard water lubricated pump. Uh, all the manufacturers, B&G, uh, Taco, Grunfoss, they're all been approved by, in this case here would be Tecma would be the control, but the Tecma mixing control will actually control the flow rate of that pump. So as this boiler plant is providing a certain water temperature and this system pump is running to provide a certain supply water, this injection pump is taking a little bit of that hot water and injecting it over and an equal amount of cooler water is coming back. So I have a pump on the boiler plant and the pump on the uh, system side. And then this third pump is my mixing device. And here's just kind of a little more detailed drawing showing <clears throat> um, the details. Again, primary, secondary connections, both on the boiler side and the system side and then instead of a mixing valve i have an injection pump and i vary the speed and as i vary the speed i vary the gpm so i influence how many gallons a minute of in this case here maybe 160 170 180 degree water gets injected over to this maybe it's a radiant system over here at low temperature and this pump's running maybe constant circulation or close to constant circulation and I'm just changing the water temperature by changing the speed of how many GPM. Then as I increase or decrease, I increase or decrease the return flow rate. Whatever doesn't get injected over here with this pump, this boiler pump bypasses through the common pipe and mixes with this to elevate the return temperature to protect perhaps a higher temperature boiler that's non-condensing. So it's just some little piping techniques. But the point of it all is outdoor reset. Change the water temperature, whether it's controlling the firing of a boiler, whether it's controlling the firing of multiple boilers, <clears throat> or whether it's controlling the positioning of a mixing valve and or the speed of an injection pump. But by constantly changing the water temperature over here, you can change the output of your terminal unit, which more closely coincides with what are the conditions that house or that building that structure is under at you know based on outdoor temperature so i'm going to have an outdoor sensor an outdoor sensor has been around a long time um, it, it's becoming standard practice i think the department of energy made it standard on all of our domestic boiler manufacturers that they needed to provide i think it was like four or five years ago on board most boiler manufacturers now have some type of water temperature outdoor reset capability built into their controls. And, and again, that was a DOE um, regulation, if you will. They all had to be compliant. <clears throat> One other quick example is if you got up into a built up system, and in this case here, we're showing a couple of modulating, condensing, lock and bar, night boilers, so they can take any kind of temperature. 
but they also are supplying heat to some fan coils. And in this case here, it looks like a plate and frame heat exchanger. Maybe they're uh, heating, it looks like a snow melt system. And then moving further to the left here, I'm doing some zone pumping, but to radiant heat. So I have, a, I have a boiler that can really handle that low temperature, radiantly heated water temp, but I'm introducing a mixing valve because I also have, in this case here, some fan coils that are gonna typically run around 160, 165, 175 degree water. So as they're running, <clears throat> you know, when there's a, maybe it's a really cold out, and they're, they're providing second stage heat to some of these radiantly heated zones. So I have a mixed temperature going to the radiant. I have a higher temperature going to the fan coils. Maybe I have a domestic call where I'm looking for 170, 180 degrees, or I have a snow melt call and I'm looking for maybe 160, 170 degree water to satisfy the plate and frame to provide the design water temperature to the snow melt. So even though I have boilers that can support low temperature, it's not uncommon to have multiple water temperatures. So I'll introduce this mixing device to satisfy my radiantly heated zones as well. So that's, a, that's pretty standard on you know, a multiple temperature uh, heating system. And, and in this case here, I'm, I might be doing outdoor reset on the high temp side. I might be doing outdoor reset on the low temp side. And then I'll have a control or maybe a family of controls that can support this application. But the point of it all is change the water temperature, changes the output, which more closely coincides with what's going on. What's the load that the building's under? And the way to do that is to have that outdoor sensor measuring the outdoor temperature. And with that, I think I have come to the end of our presentation this morning. <clears throat> So I was, gonna, I was gonna stop sharing the screen and I didn't know if anyone had any questions. Um, and if they do, now would be the time.